So the most important thing in astronomy is observing, seeing what is out there. I think the main thing um, I'm, I want to try and get across is not so much what astronomy is, but how we do it, how we use telescopes to try and understand the universe and to try and understand what's going on out there. Giant stars, Big Bang. The important thing to realise is that astronomy is a science. Um, that's what makes it interesting, but that also makes it quite challenging. So the core, the bedrock of astronomy is physics. Um, and the bedrock of physics is mathematics. So you've, you've got to have that. You've got to have an interest in physics and mathematics as well as an interest in space. That doesn't mean if you're not interested in those, you can't get involved in astronomy. But as a career, um, it's, it, it's a scientific endeavor. Um, and so you need to have that, that basis. What I want you to do is watch this and be observers. There are astronomers all over the world um, and we collaborate extensively. I mean, even in the smallest collaboration, it's rare to only have one continent. And there are some collaborations which involve every continent on the Earth, including Antarctica. So yes, it is, it's a very, very big multinational thing. Um, you get to meet lots of interesting people in other countries as well and travel to meetings or talk to them over the internet or something like that. And it really, it's, it's a good way of learning about other cultures as well as actually doing some exciting science. I think we've pretty much got everything here. I think an important part of science is just telling people what you do. Otherwise you're just sort of sitting in a corner doing it on your own and that's a bit pointless. Um, when I look around, the only field where I could do that um, was astronomy, because astronomy has all the other branches of physics in it somewhere, um, and people actually want to hear you when you talk about it in pubs or whatever like that. So, um, and then, so I sort of drifted into astronomy that way, and then I started actually getting into the nitty-gritty of it, and going observing, and playing around with galaxies, and it's fantastically good fun, and I've never regretted it for a second. Okay, good morning. good morning. My name's Andy Newsom. I'm an astronomer, and I'm going to be telling you a little bit today about what astronomers do, how we do it, why we do it, and how you can do some of it too, so how you can actually take part in astronomy. But before I do any of that, I need to know what you already know, because I don't want to tell you things you already know. That would be a waste of time. So I'm going to have to give you a bit of a test. Don't worry, it's not too hard, but just before we start the test, can you all stand up? Oh, I know. The effort. Right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you a series of simple questions like this one. And there's two possible answers to each of the questions. Now, this one is just a test, so it doesn't matter if you get this one wrong. But after this one, if you get the question wrong, you have to sit down. And we'll see how many people are left at the end. To get things started, we've got a question about the universe. How old do you think the universe is? Now then, if you think the universe is 140,000 million years old, or 140 billion years, you put your hands on your head. That's what the H is for. Okay? If you think it's just 14 billion years, you put your hands on your tail. <laughs> nice and simple. Heads 140,000 million, tails 40,000 million. So can you all make your minds up, please? Heads or tails? Hands in pockets don't count. OK. OK, it's about 50-50. Nobody's, you know, it's, it's a reasonable balance, so we're obviously not t entirely confident. It's actually 14 billion years. Now, you can all stay standing, it's just a test. OK, next question. The sun. The sun makes heat. The sun burns hydrogen in its core in nuclear reactions to make heat. And we can feel that heat. That's what allows us to live. So it's very important to us. But eventually, the sun will run out of fuel. It's going to run out of hydrogen in the core. And then it's going to stop being alive, in a sense. And it's going to die. And we think we know roughly how long the sun's going to be around for. It's quite a long time. But if you think it's 5 billion years, you put your hands on your head. And if you think it's 500 million years, you put your hands on your tail. OK, so 5 billion, 500 million. OK, most people seem to be fairly confident. One hand on each doesn't really count. OK, let's see what we're going for. Most people are going for heads. Most people are right. Well done. If you put your hands on your tail, can you sit down, please? Now we come to a slightly different sort of question. Slightly different sort of question. You're all made of atoms. Everything around us is made of atoms. The ground I'm standing on, the earth beneath it, the air in th that we breathe, it's all made of atoms. And we know several ways in which you can make these atoms. Because they've got to be made somewhere. Now, there's two possibilities. We know that you can make atoms inside giant stars. If you get a really big star, 10, 20 times the size of the sun, then inside where the nuclear reactions have gone, it's actually making atoms. And that's one way that we can make these things. But of course, it's no good to us if it's stuck inside a star. So we have to get it out. And the only way to get it out is to blow the star up. This is a picture 
of the explosion of one of these giant stars. Now, to give you some sense of scale, can you see that little white dot? Just that one. That's the same size as the entire solar system. This is an enormous explosion. And so this is one way we think that we can make atoms. But there's another way. You could just make them in the Big Bang. The Big Bang has a huge amount of energy in it before it sort of expands away. And so that's another place where you can make atoms. And we think that the majority of the different kinds of atoms in your body were made in one of these two. Now, if you think you're made of bits of exploding star, you put your hands on your head. And if you think you're made almost entirely of stuff that was made in the Big Bang, you put your hands on your tail. So giant stars, Big Bang. Pretty confident here, less confident. Upstairs, they've got no idea at all. OK, let's see what we've got, shall we? It's giant stars. Well done, most of you. Congratulations. OK. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. You are made of bits of explosion like this. Without giant explosions like this, you would not exist. And that's a fairly astonishing thing. You are made of bits of these exploding stars. And they must have gone off once or twice or even three times in order to make all the atoms in your body. And we know these things because we're able to study the universe and find them out. But there's other things we know. We can count things. Counting things is very important in astronomy because if you don't know how many things there are, you can't understand them as a whole. This is a picture of a galaxy, our galaxy. It's called the Milky Way. Um, it's got bright patches and dark patches. And it's made of stars, lots of stars. Now, we can make a good guess about exactly how many stars there are in our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's on the order of a billion, probably. But if you think it's less than a billion, you put your hands on your head. And if you think it's more than a billion, you put your hands on your tail. This is a slightly tricky one. So less than a billion, hands on your head. More than a billion, hands on your tail. Looking pretty good so far. Everybody made their minds up? We've got at least one girl here with a hand, one hand on the head, one hand on the tail. That's a bit dodgy. OK, let's see if you're right. It's more. Well done, those with the hands on the tail. Just think about that number for a bit. 200,000 million stars. Most of them quite like the sun. Some are a bit bigger, some are a bit smaller, but they're basically a bit like the sun. And it's quite likely that most of those have planets. And some of those planets may even have life on. That's a huge number of planets. And we're one, but we can look at the other ones and try and see, see what's going on. Now, that's one galaxy. There are other galaxies. This is the galaxy called Andromeda. It's next door to us. And it's, like, it's the closest galaxy to us. It's the closest big galaxy to us. And we know there are lots of other galaxies out there, because we can find them. We know there are a very, very large number of them, in fact. But I wonder if you can guess exactly how many. I'm going to give you a little hint on this one, because this is quite a tricky one. In one night once, in a telescope in Hawaii, when I was doing some observing, I personally discovered... 50,000 galaxies by accident. Okay, so there are a lot of them out there. If you can discover 50,000 when you're not even trying, there's going to be a lot. But the number I'm really interested in here is a billion. If you think there are less than a billion galaxies, hands on your head, more than a billion galaxies, hands on your tail. Now, this is the last question, so it all comes down to this one. We'll see how many of you are left standing at the end. Less than a billion, more than a billion. OK, not quite so sure about this one. Most of you are going for more than a billion. Let's see if you're right. Well done. Can you give yourselves a round of applause? And everybody can now sit down. Thank you. OK, thank you. There were some facts. Some facts to get us started with. And quite a lot of you knew them all, which is very good, by the way. Most people, I usually end up with a handful of people left when I'm doing this, so that was very good. Congratulations. Now, we, I told you, some of you know how old the universe is. Some of you knew, knew how, when the sun would die, what we're made of, how many stars there are, how many galaxies. These are all important facts. But if you're thinking like a scientist, you'll be asking yourself one other question, and it's the single most important question that any scientist ever asks. And that question is, how do we know? How do we know these things? I could have just made them up. You're not going to be able to check. But I didn't make them up. We know because we can look out into the universe and we can study the universe and we can understand the universe. Basically, we know all of these facts because of telescopes. These are some telescopes in Hawaii. 
big ones there. You can see, see the clouds above you, but there's also a lot of clouds below you. Most of the clouds tend to be below you when you're on these observing sites because that makes it easier to observe. These things are quite big. I'll talk about the size a bit later. Um, but we build these telescopes to look at the universe and try and understand what we see. And we've been doing this for quite a long time now. And we do it because astronomy is a slightly unusual science. Most sciences are experimental. If I was a chemist and I want to understand what happens when two chemicals get mixed together, I'd mix two chemicals together. It's not complicated. It can be quite difficult to do technically, but there's no mental challenge to that. Astronomy, we can't really do that. If we want to know what happens when a star gets hotter, we can't heat it up. We can't put a giant Bunsen burner under the sun and see what happens. It's a good job some dangerous lunatic would have done by now. But we can't do this. We can't build experiments. All we can do is observe. So we don't do that. We do this. This is some of my students out in Tenerife using a telescope to look at the universe and try and understand what they see. And that makes astronomy an observational science. And that makes it almost unique. There are very few observational sciences. And they have special skills that you need to understand what's going on. But they've got special advantages. And I'll try and explain some of those advantages as I go through the talk today. Just to give you some idea how important this is, this is a picture of the night sky that you might see if you went out in London on a really clear night. And you can see a few dots. Not a huge number, but there are a few dots there. And they're the stars. Some of you may recognize this constellation here. That's the constellation of Orion. But you don't tend to see much more than this if you're in the middle of a city because of the street lights. That's what this orange glow is. It's the street lights. But if you're lucky and you can go somewhere really dark, and I mean really dark, not just the middle of a park somewhere, but right out in the countryside, but there's no street lights at all. And the weather's nice and clear, and it's a good night, and you let your eyes adjust to the dark, you'll see something a little bit more. You'll see something a bit more like this. You'll see a few more stars. You might even see this little pattern down here, but you'll also see this glowing band going across the sky. Now, does anybody know what that glowing band is? Yeah, the back there. I think it's the Milky Way. It's the Milky Way, that's right. That's what the Milky Way actually looks like. It does look like milk. Can you put your hands up? Anybody who's ever seen the Milky Way? One, two. Good, quite a few of you. If you haven't, it's stunning. It's a stunning thing to see. Go somewhere very dark on your holidays. Um, go out at night on a clear night. Give your eyes 10, 20 minutes to get used to the dark and look at the sky. And then you'll be able to see this amazing glowing band across the sky. Now, it looks a bit like milk, but it's not milk. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and it's quite difficult to tell that just with our own eyes. Our eyes are not good at doing astronomy. Our eyes were not designed for doing astronomy. Evolution designed our eyes to stop us getting eaten by saber-toothed tigers. They're very good at that or we wouldn't be here. But they're not good for doing astronomy. If you wanted eyeballs that were good at doing astronomy, we'd have eyeballs 10 metres across. That would be uncomfortable. But if we did have eyeballs 10 metres across, we would see the universe a lot better. However, because we don't, we do something better than expanding our eyeballs using weird genetic engineering. We build instruments. Things like cameras and telescopes. What I'm going to show you next is a photograph of this part of the sky. And it's just an ordinary photograph taken with an ordinary camera, but with a very, very long exposure. Seven hours. And when you do that, this is the kind of thing you start being able to see. And that is what the sky really should look like. That's what the sky would look like if we had giant eyeballs. And suddenly, this doesn't look like milk anymore. If your milk looks like that, do not drink it. <laughs> it looks like stars. And that's what it is. It's millions of stars. And we can suddenly see colours. That's a reddish star. That's a bluish star. There are stars over here we couldn't see at all. There's these big red fuzzy clouds. There's lots of stuff going on in there. And our job as astronomers is to understand all that and use that to try and understand more about the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry. Why is that one red and that one blue? Why are some stars faint and some stars bright? What are these big red fuzzy things? And we've sort of got the answers to most of those questions. There are still details we're not sure about, but we've sort of got the answers to those questions because we can see it. But until you can see it, you can't even start to answer the questions because you don't know what the questions are. So the most important thing in astronomy is observing, seeing what is out there. Then you try and explain it. And the first person to really do this was Galileo. 400 years ago this year, this gentleman, Galileo, who probably looked nothing like that, but it's a nice statue, he looked at the sky with a telescope, at the night sky, and he tried to understand what he saw. Now, he was not the first person ever to use a telescope. He certainly didn't invent the telescope. But he was the first person to report what he saw and try and understand it. Now, there was somebody else who was actually looking at the, at the sky with a telescope and trying to understand it. That was a guy called Thomas Harriot, who was English. But he didn't tell anybody. He kept very quiet. And that was a very sensible thing to do. Because what Harriot saw and what Galileo saw didn't fit. He didn't fit with what everybody expected them to see. Because everybody had a very simple view of the universe then. It's a very reasonable one, but it was very simple. 
The earth was at the centre, because it had to be. And surrounding the earth were the heavens. So the earth was imperfect, and the heavens were perfect. And the heavens were, were things like the stars, and the planets, and the moon, and the sun. And they were stuck on giant spheres of crystal, giant spheres of perfectly transparent glass, which revolved slowly. And that's what made the planets, and the stars, and the sun, and the moon appear to move. And Galileo and Harriet both looked at this, and that's not what they saw. What they saw changed the way we see the universe. This is an example of what Galileo saw when he looked at the moon. Now, these don't come as a surprise to us. We've seen much better pictures of the moon than this. But nobody else had before. These are some of Galileo's sketches of the moon at different phases. And he saw lumps. He saw craters. He saw mountains. He saw that it was rough. And that didn't fit. Because only the Earth was supposed to be imperfect. Everything in the heavens was supposed to be perfectly smooth. And this obviously wasn't. Now, that was not a ma perhaps a major problem, but it was the hint that there was something weird going on out there. And so he looked a bit further away. He looked at Jupiter. These are some of his sketches of Jupiter. The circle there is Jupiter, and then he's got little dots next to him. And this is covers of about a month. So every clear night that he could, he went and he looked at Jupiter, and he noticed that these little dots moved backwards and forwards. They didn't always stay in the same place. Now, does anybody know what they are? Yeah, over here. They're Jupiter's moons. They are the moons of Jupiter. We now call them the Galilean moons, the four big moons of Jupiter. And they went backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And this didn't fit. This was not what everybody expected to see. Because everything is supposed to go round the Earth. And these things were going round Jupiter. I mean, just looking at this pragmatically, Jupiter is supposed to be stuck on a giant sphere of glass. Every time a moon goes round, it'll break. Sounds silly, but that was a serious problem. It was particularly a serious problem for the church. Because they did not like this view of the universe. And Galileo got into a lot of trouble for this. Put under house arrest for the rest of his life, that sort of thing. It was only because the Pope was a school friend of his that he got away with only house arrest. Harriet didn't have that option, Thomas Harriet. He was already in trouble, actually, because he'd been on the wrong side of a, an argument with the Queen. And if he said anything more to rock the boat, he was going to get his head cut off, and he didn't really want that. So he kept quiet. Galileo had a big mouth and he didn't. And we've got to be very grateful for Galileo's big mouth because he started what we now call science. He said, I've looked at the universe with my telescope. I've seen what's actually out there. And my job now is to try and explain that. Now, that was not how most people thought at the time, but it's how we all think now. And it began with Galileo and his telescope, trying to understand what we can see, whether it's out in the universe or on a laboratory bench. That is what scientists do. Now, this is a replica of one of Galileo's telescopes. And it's about this big, quite a large thing. But the important bit is the lens. That collects the light and brings it to a focus. Now, nowadays, we tend not to use lenses in our telescopes. We tend to use mirrors. This is one of my mirrors, in fact, from, from one of my telescopes, which I brought along. And you can see it looks like a, a round mirror. However, for those of you over there, can you see your reflection in that? OK. It's upside down and looks a bit weird, doesn't it? That's because it's not a flat mirror. It's very slightly curved. And that means it can also focus light. And so if I actually shine some light on this, we should be able to see that. This is just an ordinary overhead projector over here. What I'm doing is I'm shining light on my mirror. It should be in there. Yep. Can I have the lights dimmed, please? And what's happening this has got knocked, is the light is hitting the mirror, and it's coming to a focus on that pearl guild over there. You can just about see the light shining on it like that. Okay. <laughs> now, that doesn't look particularly surprising. But if I follow the beam of the light, if I, the light's coming from the projector, it's hitting the mirror, and it's going over there. If I actually follow the beam of that, if I can find it, yeah, there we go. Can you see? Whoops, this is just a bit of water. Don't worry about it. i stay out of the light. If I follow the beam of that, can you see it comes to a focus just over there? And so what's happening is the light is hitting the mirror, and it's coming to a focus. And if you put your camera at the focus, then you can take pictures. And that's how we do astronomy nowadays. That's how astronomy works. Now, this is bigger than Galileo's telescope. But it's not really a very big mirror. It costs a couple of hundred pounds. They're quite nice little things. But nowadays, we tend to use slightly larger mirrors than that when we're doing astronomy. This sort of size. This is a mirror in one of the Gemini telescopes. That white thing in the middle is a person. And he's about six foot tall. So this is a big mirror. Now, you can see he's wearing a sort of weird outfit. That's because he can't breathe on the mirror. This is one of the smoothest surfaces in the universe. It's incredibly smooth. If you were to take this thing and make it the same size as Britain, the biggest lump would be about that tall. 
And so if he actually breathes on this or touches it, he'll distort that surface. He might move a molecule, and that's a problem. It's at that level. And they're quite expensive to make. Obviously, if you make something that size with a surface that smooth, it's not going to be cheap. I think this one cost about £40 million to make. Now, that's a lot of money. And it's a lot of time and effort and a lot of silly outfits. And you could be justified in asking, why do we bother? I mean, that focuses like perfectly well. Galileo was able to change our complete view of the universe with something with a lens this size. Why do we build telescopes so enormous? Why do we spend all this time and effort and money to make them so big? Well, it's actually very simple. The bigger the mirror, the more light you collect. And the more light you collect, the fainter the things that you can see. And that is what matters. Because faint things can be really interesting. Now, does anybody have any idea why faint things might be interesting? Yeah, right over there. Um, because if you see, if there could be more galaxies out there that you can't see because yeah. they're faint, and yeah. maybe um, quasars. There might, might be things which are too far away to be bright. Yes, good. Distance is a very important one. That's good. Are there any other reasons why something might be faint, though? It might be a long way away, or it might be something else that makes it faint. Yes. Um, well, you might, because there could be a black hole that's eating a star, so you can't see the star very well. Yeah, it's a good point. Black holes are black. And if, they're, if you've got something near a black hole, that could block out some of the light. Or dust could do the same thing. So there might just be something blocking out some of the light. Yes? Resolution? Might, yeah, you, you might just have to be able to get very, very small things. And they can look quite faint because the, all the light gets blurred out. Very good. Any other, any other reasons why things might be faint? Right at the back there. It might just be something that's intrinsically faint. It might be small. It might be old. Old things might fade away. It might be young. Things might get brighter as, as, as they get older. And so if we really want to understand everything that's out there, we have to be able to see the faint things. One of the main reasons is actually they just might be small. Now, we tend to think of astronomy as being about big things, giant explosions, and it is. That's one of the reasons why it's fun. But we also look at faint things as well, small things, because they can tell us a lot. This is a small thing. It's an asteroid. It's a big lump of rock, but it's small compared to a planet, and it's very faint, very difficult to see. But these are interesting, and they're interesting for two main reasons. One is they're very old. We think asteroids were made before the Earth was, and so they're made of very old stuff. They're made of the stuff that was then used to make the Earth, and so we can understand more about where the Earth came from and where we came from if we understand asteroids. And the other reason is one of these might come and hit us, and then we will all die. This would be a bad thing. And so we'd quite like to stop that. I'll be coming back to that later, because there's actually an important bit of science there that we might need your help to do. But other small things. This is an artist's impression of an extrasolar planet. That's a planet, and that's another star. An extrasolar planet is a planet going around a star other than the sun. And these are very, very difficult to spot. But if you want to understand anything about life and anything about where planets came from, we've got to find these things. We've got to find thousands of them. We've got several hundred already, and there's a lot of people working on this. But this is important if we're really going to know whether we are alone in the universe. That's a big question that a lot of people want to answer. Or they might just be small because they're weird. That, believe it or not, is a star. And this is a star. And they're right next to each other. So this one is obviously very faint. And it's faint because it's small. But it's not light. It's very massive. It's got the same amount of stuff in it as this thing. But it's much smaller. That means it's much denser. That is a thing called a white dwarf. Now, white dwarfs have some interesting physics in them. If you were to take a piece of white dwarf the size of a matchbox, it would weigh roughly the same as 15 elephants. Now, can you imagine squeezing 15 elephants down into a matchbox? Messy. But when you got there, you would have something as dense as a white dwarf. And that's extraordinary. But it doesn't stop there. We also have neutron stars. I haven't got a picture of a neutron star because we've never been able to get a decent image of one. They're too small and too faint. But we know they exist, and we know they are ridiculously dense. If you take a piece of neutron star the size of a matchbox, it weighs as much as whales, and I don't mean the animal. <laughs> Can you imagine taking all of Wales, all of the mountains, all of the people, all of the cities, all of the bedrock, and crushing it down into a matchbox? That's insane. But we know they're out there, and we want to understand them. We want to know where they came from, and we want to understand the physics of what's going on there. And so we've got to look at faint things to do that. But the other main reason why things might be faint, which we've got from, from the, at the back, is they might be a long way away. And this is where it starts to get really interesting. This is a picture of galaxies. This is a thing called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is a picture taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's a two-week exposure. So they opened the shutter on the camera and left it open for two weeks. These are the faintest things any human being has ever seen. 
And every, uh, that's a star. That one there with the spikes going through it is a star. Every single other speck in this image, even the tiny little faint ones, are galaxies. And they're not small galaxies. They've got hundreds of thousands of millions of stars in, just like our own Milky Way. They look small because they're so far away. And the weird thing about that is it must mean that we're looking at them in the past. We're looking back in time. I will now try and explain that, because some of you are looking very blank, and I don't blame you. It's a bit weird. But that's how it works. Coming back to this picture, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you a movie which zooms in on this part of Orion. It's called the Orion Nebula. And as we zoom in, you'll see that that's not actually a bunch of stars, but it's a giant cloud. It's a cloud of dust and gas. But it's very hot, so it glows. And that hot, glowing cloud of dust and gas, as you get closer and closer and closer, you start to see tiny little specks, little dark specks. There's one. There's another one in the middle there. There's a faint one down there. Those dark specks are very important. Now, does anybody have any idea what those dark specks might be? Yeah, right towards the back there. Um, the start of a black hole? It might be. That's a very good guess. They might be the site of a black hole, because black holes are black. Unfortunately, black holes aren't really black. They're actually invisible. There could be lots of black holes there, but we still wouldn't be able to see them. So that's a bit of a problem. It's a good guess. It could be that, but it's not, unfortunately. Yes? The uh, beginning of stars? Beginning of stars. That's right. These are new stars. They're brand new stars. They're little baby stars. They're only a million years old. Ha. Huh. They're cute little stars just forming. Now, the bright bit in the middle is the star, a hot, new, young star. And the dark stuff surrounding it is dust, much finer than the dust we have on Earth. But nevertheless, dust, tiny little atoms and molecules. And what happens with that dust is it's slightly sticky. And so bits of dust stick to other bits of dust, and you get larger bits of dust. And then those stick to other bits, and you get clumps. And the clumps stick to other clumps, and you get very big clumps. And that keeps happening until you end up with extremely big clumps that we call planets. You're looking at a new solar system forming. In a few billion years' time, that will be an ordinary star, a bit like the sun, with planets going around it. And we're seeing it as it's starting. But the reason I'm showing you this is because we're not seeing it as it is now. Because light takes time to travel. It goes very fast. It goes seven times around the Earth in a second. It moves incredibly fast. But it does take time to travel. And this is a long way away. It's so far away, in fact, that it has taken light one and a half thousand years to get here. It's one and a half thousand light years away. So when we look at pictures like this of the Orion Nebula, we're not looking at it as it is now. We're looking at it as it was one and a half thousand years ago. Now, that doesn't really matter, because it doesn't change much in one and a half thousand years. But it does mean that if there are planets in, in Orion with advanced civilizations on them, and they've got giant telescopes, and they can look back at the Earth, they won't see us. They won't see the Royal Institution. They'll see a few sheds called Londinium, because what they will see is the Romans leaving. One and a half thousand years ago, that was what was happening around here. The Romans were leaving Britain. And that's all that the people in Orion, the creatures in Orion, will be able to see. If they're really lucky and they know where to look, they might see King Arthur dying at the Battle of Camlan. Now, we think that happened, but we don't know for certain. Anyone in Orion can look and actually see that happening. And they'll know for certain. They probably won't have the faintest idea what's going on, but they will be able to see it. So they can see things that we can't which must mean that we can see things that they can't. Now, one and a half thousand years sort of doesn't matter in, in astronomy. But if you go a bit further away, say to Andromeda, you start getting longer timescales. This is our next door neighbor galaxy. It's the closest one to us. And it's two and a half million light years away. So light has taken two and a half million years to get all the way from Andromeda to go into the camera to take that picture. And so if there are creatures in Andromeda with telescopes the size of planets, and they can look towards us, and they're bothering to look at us, then again, they won't even see the Romans. What they will see is the beginning of the last ice age, two and a half million years ago. If they see any human-like things at all, they'll be using stone tools. So they can look back in time at us, and we can look back in time at them. If they want to know about us, they've got to wait two and a half million years. And I'm sure it's worth it, but nevertheless, that's how long they have to wait before they will know about the Royal Institution and so on. And when you start looking at very distant objects, the time scales become enormous. I'm going to go back to the Hubble Deep Field. This is this Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and this is just a blow-up of part of it. And all of these little specks here, all these little blue things and that big one, are galaxies. And some of these are so far away that it has taken, like, not millions, but billions of years to get here. Light has been travelling for four, five, eight, ten billion years. And so if there are creatures in these galaxies looking towards us, the sun doesn't exist let alone the Earth, let alone us. But we can look back in time at them as well, and we can look at galaxies as they were 10 billion years ago, when the universe was a bit different. We can look at how the universe evolves 
by studying very different, distant things. And for that, we need very big telescopes and very powerful cameras. And it doesn't stop there. Not only can we look back in time, but we can use weird kinds of light as well. We're used to light. There's lots of it in here. We can see what we're doing. Everything's fine. That's what astronomers call visible light or optical. Visible light is stuff that our eyes can see. But there's other kinds of light, other kinds of electromagnetic radiation. There's a whole electromagnetic spectrum out there. Can anybody name any, any other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum? Yeah. Infrared. Infrared. Good one. Any others? Yeah. Ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. Good. Any more? Yep. X-ray. X-ray. Any others? Yep. Radio, good. Any more? Yep, go on. Gamma rays. Gamma rays. Any more? Yeah. We've nearly run out. Don't worry about it. Okay, there's one or two others. Yep. Microwaves. Microwaves. That's the only one, other one I was looking for. We've got radio waves. We've got infrared and microwaves. We've got visible, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. All of these are different kinds of electromagnetic radiation. And the great thing about them is they tell us different things. Now, visible light is made by things which are quite hot. Things which are... A, a couple of thousand, a few thousand degrees centigrade. The filaments in these lights will be at three or four thousand degrees centigrade. If I were to take one of you and heat you up to about five thousand degrees centigrade, you would scream a lot. But when you finish screaming, you would start glowing with visible light. It's as simple as that. But if you want to get x-rays, a few thousand degrees centigrade isn't enough. You need a few million degrees centigrade. So if we look out in the universe and see something making x-rays, it must be incredibly hot. There must be a lot of energy. We're going to learn new physics. Now, one obvious place to look is at the sun. This is a picture taken with a special telescope of the sun. You should never look at the sun, by the way, because you can damage your eyes. But if you've got the right kind of telescope, you can take pictures like this. And it's not a big surprise. If you were to go out today, it's a nice sunny day, and you hold your hand up, you can feel that the sun is hot. It's a big, hot, glowing ball. We know it's at about 6,000 degrees centigrade. It glows to produce visible light. There's a few things on here. There's these sort of dark sunspots, the brighter patches. There's these weird filaments and flares around the edge, and there's this mottled pattern. But basically, it's a big, hot, glowing ball. No shock. And you'd think it would sort of stop there, because we know the surface of the sun is at about 6,000 degrees centigrade. And you'd expect that if you look with an X-ray telescope, you wouldn't see anything at all, because there's nothing's going to be at a million degrees centigrade. Well, that's not quite true. This is an X-ray image of the sun. That's what it looks like at exactly the same time as this picture. If you look at these sunspots, for example, you can see there's quite a lot of X-ray activity going on around there as well. Somewhere... Somehow, parts of the sun are getting heated up to millions of degrees centigrade, and they're making x-rays. And we want to understand how that happens, because we want to understand the sun. It's very important that we understand the sun. Not just because it's interesting, because it could actually affect our ability to continue to live. I'll explain that in a few minutes. But before we do that, it's probably a good idea to just practice your observing skills. So we're going to do a bit of that. This is a movie taken by a satellite called SOHO, which is an x-ray satellite pointing at the sun. And it's a movie that covers 15 hours in the life of the sun. Don't worry, I have speeded it up. What I want you to do is watch this and be observers. I want you to look at this and just see things. Don't try and understand them, don't try and explain them, but just see them. And I want you to look for two things in particular. I want you to look for things that change. Changes are very important in this. And I want you to look for shapes, any shapes that you think might be interesting. So we'll run through it once. And then we'll see how good you are as, as, as observers. So remember, we're looking for things that change and interesting shapes. Put your hands up. What do you see? Changes and shapes. Yes, straight away. Um, there were some uh, EMPs to see because it was clear. You mean sort of speckles on yeah. the camera? Yeah. The speckles on the camera are important. Very good. Yes. There's this kind of there's flashes. We'll just call them that for now. There are flashes going on. And they, what, do we, what do you mean by prominences? So a bit sticking out. Yeah. yeah, they're a bit sticking out. Good. Any other changes in shapes? Right at the back there. Both of you look tiny. There's one after the other. Like explosions. There are, there are explosions. There are flashes. There are, yes, very good. Yep. The um, explosions, they just seem to build up and then explode. And yep. they, they seem to have like ovals. Ovals. The ovals are good. Excellent. So we've got the ovals, we've got things building up and then going flash. Right over here, I saw a hand. Yes. They're like volcanic eruptions, aren't they? Yeah, they sort of have that building up and then a big splash. Excellent. Any other changes in particular? Yes? Um, like, uh, where the, where's the light? Uh, there's kind of like little things coming up from like sort of buildings. Yeah, the, the oval, yes, I, got, I know what you mean. These sort of oval shapes are all kind of stuck to the very bright bits, aren't they? That's important. Good. Any other changes? Yes? The sort of faint corona, sort of like mist or but there's this kind of mist around the outside, isn't there? It's not a nice, simple ball. That's very important. Right in the middle at the back there. After they've exploded, they change shape. Yep, good. Very good. 
you've got, the, the, you've got the big loops and arcs and things, and then there's explosion. Quite often they've gone. There's a very big change that nobody's mentioned yet. A very big change. We've got the big change. Is that a curiosity? When they blow up, they get brighter. Yep, when they blow up, they get brighter. Good. That's not quite the one I'm thinking of, though. Yes? It's kind of like when the camera's like all over at Tesco. Whenever it's like at it, it's like not exploding. And then when it moves around, it's exploding from the side. Like it, it, it does seem to explode more at the edge than in the middle, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit weird, that one. I mean, there are actually explosions going on. I think it's partly because they're easier to see at the edge. But yes, that is happening. Yes, up here. It looks like, um, you know those ovals that are really bright? They're yeah. like loops yeah. outwards. Excellent. Loops outwards. OK, we, we're doing, I think we've pretty much got everything here. The one big change that nobody's mentioned yet. Go on, have a go. Um, it looks like the sun here, parts of it are almost moving and sort of changing colour and stuff. It is. It's all kind of swirling around, isn't it? That's a very important big change. Yes. It's turning. It's turning. Thank you. Oh, I thought we'd never get there. It's all going round. That's really important. OK, let's see if we can explain this. Now, the main things I want you to think about to start with are the shapes, in particular these loop-like shapes that you see occasionally. Can you see little loops there? There's some loops there. Where have you ever seen a loop like that in your science lessons, these kind of loop-like shapes? Yeah. It, yeah, they are a bit loop-like, but then that's not quite... I'm thinking about something especially in a science lesson. Yes. Magnetic, magnetic fields. Very good. We've got magnetic fields. Now, the Earth has a magnetic field, but it's much simpler than this, isn't it? The Earth just has a big double-loop magnetic field. This has strange magnetic fields where you've only got one loop. The other one must be hidden inside, and they're all over the place. And that's because of this spin. Now, the Earth is spinning as well, but the Earth is a solid. The Sun is a liquid. And so as it spins, some bits spin faster than others. That means it gets twisted, and the magnetic fields get twisted. It's a bit like an elastic band. If I were to take an elastic band like this and start twisting it, it doesn't like it. It wants to untwist. I'm storing potential energy in the elastic band. Now, if I let go, ow, um, then it untwists very quickly, and it releases energy. That's why my fingers hurt. And so if you twist things up and store energy in them, and then let them untwist, you release that energy. Now, magnetic fields can do something the elastic bands can't do, though. Magnetic fields can snap themselves. They can snap themselves, unwind, and then stick themselves back together again. That's called magnetic reconnection. And we can see it happening all the time on the sun here. That's a magnetic field. It's getting twisted, and it will untwist, snap, untwist, and release the energy. And that energy comes out as one of these explosions. All of these little flickers and flashes are the magnetic fields snapping and sticking themselves back together all the time. Now, they look like little flickers and flashes. But they're actually quite large explosions. Can you see that green speck just fading away there? There's another one down there. They're about the same size as the Earth. So these are enormous explosions. If you were to take every nuclear weapon that's ever been made and blow them up on the sun, we wouldn't be able to see it. So these are vast explosions. And sometimes you get those little speckles. And what's happening there is the explosion is throwing stuff into space, little particles, atoms and electrons, and neutrons, and protons. And they're flying out into space. And sometimes they come towards the camera, and they actually hit the camera. So those little speckles are not x-rays. They're bits of the sun hitting the camera. And so we can explain most of what's going on here by saying we've got a magnetic field that's very strong, and it's getting twisted and twisted and twisted, and that energy is heating up the material to make x-rays, and sometimes it's producing explosions. And we can see all of that going on, and we can sort of begin to understand it. And it's quite important we understand it, because occasionally things like this happen. This just keeps looping. But you can see that's a big flash. And you can see before the flash, you've got these lovely magnetic fields. You get the big explosion, and then they've gone. So we can see it happening in front of us. But you can also see these weird spiky things coming out of the explosion. Now, they're slightly odd, but they're not actually real. That's the camera saturating. The camera couldn't cope. This flare was too bright. And that gives us two possibilities. Either there was something really, really weird about this flare, or whoever built the camera got it badly wrong. Now, fortunately, they got the camera right. This was a weird flare. This was 10,000 times brighter than any flare that had ever been seen before or since. It's enormous. Now, we're lucky. You can see this is right on the edge of the sun. That means that all those little, you don't get the speckles on the camera. All those charged particles fly out in another direction and go nowhere near us. But if that had been pointing towards the Earth, all of those charged particles would have flown out into space and they'd have flown past the Earth. And charged particles moving very fast is what we call an electric current. You don't always have to have a wire. And so if this had been pointing towards the Earth, we would have taken the entire Earth and put it in a giant electric current. This is likely to be a bad idea. There would have been some good stuff, 
The northern lights would have been stunning. You'd have been able to see them for months, right the way down to the equator. It would have been amazing. But that is the end of the good stuff. Um, the national grid of Canada would probably have blown up. Now, this is a problem if you're Canadian. Nobody else seems to care. Um, <laughs> but it's an issue. Several satellites would have fallen out of orbit. They get sort of an, a, an extra kind of friction. And they, their systems shut down, and they can actually fall out of orbit. They're probably burnt up in the atmosphere. So it's very unlikely that anything would have hit the ground. But it would still have caused a lot of damage. Um, it's quite possible that no mobile phone would have worked for at least a month. And I, now some of you are sounding worried. Don't care about the Canadians, but be mobile. <laughs> this is something that people are concerned about. But the, the good thing is, if we get a bit of warning, if we know that this is going to happen, 10 minutes warning is probably enough, we can protect these systems. We can protect the National Grid, grid of Canada, which will keep the Canadians happy. We can protect some of the satellites. We might even be able to, to stop the, the, the mobile phones being out for more than a few minutes rather than a few days or weeks. So we can do something about this if we understand it. But we can only understand it if we can see it, and we can only see it by using the right kind of telescopes. So what I've said so far gives you a summary of the kind of things that we do in astronomy. We look further away. We build giant telescopes so that we can look further away and we can look back in time. We have a sort of time machine with our telescopes. It's a bit selective, but it works. We can see very faint things, small things, weird things, things like asteroids, things like neutron stars. We can see in more detail. You heard this down here. With a big enough mirror, you can actually see more detail on the things you're looking at. And that detail can help you to understand it better. And by using other kinds of light, things like X-rays, or radio waves, or infrared, or ultraviolet, or any of these things, we can understand the physics of what's going on a bit more. And so that's what astronomers do. This is the science that we do. But I think it's about time you did some yourself. So we're going to do some science now. We're going to do this science. This is an artist's impression. It is a good thing that this is an artist's impression. Because if this was a photograph, we would all be dead. This is what we think happens when a very large asteroid hits the Earth. To give you some sense of scale, that bluish glow there is the atmosphere. And this splash is about the same size as northern Europe. Now, we think something like this may have wiped out the dinosaurs. Now, from our personal point of view, that was a good thing. Because if the dinosaurs hadn't, hadn't been wiped out, they would have kept evolving, and I'd be talking to a room full of lizards. <laughs> if this happens again, the chances are that we're the ones that get wiped out, and the cockroaches take over. Any cockroaches in the audience? No? Oh, there's one at the back. Good. OK, you've got nothing to worry about. Everybody else needs to be concerned. OK? So what we want to do is see if we can stop this. Now, 20, 30 years ago, there's nothing we could have done. And it's very unlikely to happen. It happens maybe every 20, 30 million years. Not worth getting losing sleep over. But it turns out that now we have a sufficient technology that we might, might be able to stop it. And if you could stop it, it's probably worth checking to see if there are any out there. And that's what we do. We try and understand asteroids and see if any of them might be coming in our direction. This is an asteroid. It's called 433 Eros. It's not a very special asteroid. It's a perfectly normal one. It looks a bit like a potato. They do. Asteroids look like potatoes. Don't know why. And you can see it's got little knocks and dents in it where it's been hit by other smaller asteroids. The only thing that's special about this is a satellite called NIA, which is a Japanese satellite, actually went and landed on Eros. So we know a lot about it. But other than that, it's just a normal hunk of rock floating around in space. There's lots of them. This is where the textbooks will tell you all the asteroids are. It's not a big surprise. You've got the sun in the middle, you've got the Earth's orbit there, Mars's orbit there, right the way out here we've got Jupiter's orbit, and between Mars and Jupiter we have the asteroid belt, which is where all the asteroids are. It's nice and simple. It's clear, it's concise, it's easy to understand, and it's wrong. If I actually draw you a diagram of where the asteroids really are, it looks like this. Now, yes, there are lots of them in the asteroid belt, but they're not all there. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to colour code this. Don't worry if you can't see the colours. Some people can, some people can't. But... The colours help a little bit to understand what's going on. The green here are the ones in the asteroid belt. They just go round and round and round and round and round in circles. And they stay there. And we don't care about those. They're mildly interesting, but we're not too stressed about them. Out here, you might just be able to see some blue ones. There's a clump there and a clump there. They're a bit weird. They have got trapped by Jupiter's gravity, and they follow Jupiter around all the time. It's a bit like having an annoying little brother. Now, they're also interesting, but they're not dangerous, because they're going to stay out here following Jupiter. You can never get rid of them. But the ones we're interested in now are the red ones. These red ones are a bit weirder. They have slightly strange orbits, because they have orbits that start out here, 
And then they come in and they go out. And they come in and they go out. And they come in and they go out. And they keep doing that. And every time they come in or go out, they cross the orbit of the Earth. And if they happen to cross the orbit of the Earth, when the orbit is in the same place, then they will hit us. Now, it's very unlikely. The Earth is very small. Asteroids are even smaller. So the chances of them hitting is very low, but it's possible. And if we can work out whether or not they're going to, then those very rare ones that might, we might be able to stop them. Now, this is what happens when you don't. This is a crater, the Barringer Crater in Arizona, and it's made by an asteroid hitting the ground. To give you some sense of scale, it's about nearly two kilometers across, 170 meters deep. That is a road, again, to give you some idea of the size of things. These tiny little specks down there are trees. So it's a big hole in the ground. And this is made by an asteroid about 40 metres across, so a bit smaller than this room. Right, about, now, about the same size as this room. Now, that seems like a pretty big lump of rock. But that is far smaller than any asteroid we have ever seen. We cannot find asteroids that small. All of those dots I showed you, all the red dots, all the green dots, all the blue dots, they're all much bigger than that. 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 times bigger. Now, when something like this hits, it could wipe out a city. But there's nothing we can do about it, and frankly, people aren't that worried. I mean, let's say this hits Manchester. I live in Liverpool. <laughs> so this is something to be mildly concerned about, but most people would not be directly affected. The ones we're worried about are the ones that don't, not the ones that make a hole the size of a city, but the ones that make a hole the size of a continent. Because they won't just wipe out Manchester, they would wipe out pretty much everybody. And so they're the ones we're concerned about. Again, I have to stress, it's very unlikely that they will come along, but they might. So you've got to find them first. This is a telescope designed to find asteroids. It's called the GTS-2. There's a GTS-1 as well. It's a smallish telescope, and it points at the sky, and it finds asteroids, which is great. It's found a lot of them. I think this one telescope has found over 1,000 asteroids now. And that's a good start. But finding them is not enough. Once you've found them, you've got to work out whether or not they're dangerous. And so what you have to do is get another telescope which is designed slightly differently, to follow up the asteroid once you've found it. And you follow it, and you work out the orbit. And once you've calculated the orbit, you can then predict where the asteroid is going to be next year, or the year after, or in 10 years, or 100, or 200 years' time. And you can decide whether or not that could possibly hit the Earth. And if it could, you worry about it, and if it couldn't, you put it in the drawer and forget about it. Nearly all of them, you just put in the drawer and forget about it. But occasionally, you, find one of the, you might find one of the hazardous ones. This is the kind of thing we do when we calculate the orbits. You can see here, this is the motion of all of the known asteroids when this particular movie was made. It's about six months old now. And you can see all the red ones going around here and the green ones going around here. This is calculated. This is predicting into the future where they will be. And none of these are going to hit the Earth. We know that. None of them are going to hit the Earth for hundreds of years, at the very least. And so these are all safe. And we can forget about them. The ones we're worried about are the ones that aren't on this diagram, either because we haven't found them yet, all because we don't know what their orbits are yet. They've been found, but we haven't been able to follow them up. And to follow them up, I use this telescope. This is the Liverpool Telescope, the world's largest fully robotic telescope. Um, it's out in the Canary Islands. It's a very nice instrument. It's quite, got quite a big mirror. The mirror's about two metres across. This is another photograph showing you why we put it out there. All of this white fuzzy stuff is the cloud, and it's below you. That's where you want it. If it's below you, you don't have to care whether or not it's raining, because it's not raining on you. It's raining on the tourists. Ha -ha. This is out in the Palma in the Canary Islands, which is a very good place to put telescopes. Um, and it's used by astronomers all over the world. Because this is a very special telescope. You don't have to be there to use it. All you have to do is send a request in the internet to the telescope, and the telescope will then do that for you at the right time. You can be asleep. I use this telescope every night, and I've never been to see it on the island. Because it just gets on with it while I'm asleep. By the way, that also means that we can... Let schools use this. But this also makes this the ideal telescope to follow up asteroids. Because when an asteroid is discovered by something like GTS-2, it can then send a message straight to the telescope saying, follow this one up. This one we need to check. And the telescope can then do that. It can take some observations, and then we can use those to calculate the orbit. And that's great. That means we can do this. But there is one slight problem. And the slight problem is there aren't enough people doing this. I do a bit, but I spend a lot of my time travelling around talking to people. There are other astronomers around the world doing this, but there aren't enough of us to do it properly. And so we need help. We need your help to spot these things. What I'm doing is I'm taking these observations, and then I'm relying on you and people like you all over the country to find the asteroid. And this is a bit of a challenge, but I think you can do it. I think you're good enough. I mean, you did so well in the quiz at the beginning, I think you're going to have no problems with this at all. 
This is an observation that contains an asteroid. Now, first of all, can anybody see the asteroid? This is the first part. Anybody think they can spot the asteroid? Can you spot the asteroid? Can you point that at the screen and then just press the button on top and show us where it is? What? That one there. What's your name? Joe. Joe. Joe thinks he spotted it down here. Now, can you put your hand up if you agree with Joe? Not very many. Can you put your hand up if you think he's definitely wrong? Oh, you're not so sure. Does, so does anybody else think that they found this asteroid? No, nobody's quite... Oh, we got one in the middle. Splendid. Good, good, good. Did I see your hand up here? Eh? Go on. If you point that at the screen and then press the button on top. That one there. Good. What's your name? Jack. Sorry? Jack. Okay, Jack's gone for this one over here. Now, Joe's gone for this one and Jack's gone for that one. They can't both be right. And for the sake of argument, this could be an asteroid that's coming and hitting the Earth. So if either of you are wrong, everybody dies. <laughs> now, are you confident? Have you definitely got this right? Probably not. Probably not. OK, Jack, what do you think? Are you definitely confident you got this right? He's a confident man. I like this. Can you put your hand up if you agree with Jack? He's got some friends. Isn't that nice? Well done, Jack. Hey. OK. Jack's gone for this one. Keep an eye on that one because I'm about to start doing some image processing. Now, this is an observation straight off the telescope. When they come off the telescope, what the camera has done is detected all of the light that it can. And these cameras are very, very sensitive. This camera costs a quarter of a million pounds. And it's, we spend that much money because it can detect things that our eye can't see. And so there's information in here that we haven't seen yet. So I need to do some image processing. The first thing I'm going to do is change the contrast. Nothing else. I'm just going to change the contrast of the image to see if we can see some fainter things. Now it looks a bit more like that. And the final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use some false colors. I'm going to make it a negative, because some people find it easier to see dark things against the light background. All I've done is made that a negative image, because it's easy to see what's going on. OK, Jack, do you still think you've definitely found the asteroid? He's a very confident lad, isn't he? Keep your fingers crossed, because if not, you're going to be unpopular. You are responsible for the wiping out of the entire globe. OK, does anybody else now think that they can see the asteroid? Now they can see everything that's going on. Oh, OK, they've got one right near the back there. Splendid. So I'm going to point that at the screen and then press the button. OK, so Mo is quite confident that it's this one over here. And that's quite well spotted. Can you see that that one looks slightly different? Can you see that that one is very, very slightly fuzzy? That's very well spotted, Mo, because it's actually quite difficult to see from the front. That is actually slightly fuzzy. That one's slightly fuzzy as well. And that means that that isn't, unfortunately, an asteroid, but it is interesting. Because that means that it's a galaxy. Galaxies look fuzzy. Stars look like dots. And so you've discovered a galaxy. Well done, but I don't think you found the asteroid. Anybody else think they've got this asteroid? Oh, we've got a whole load up there, excuse me. <laughs> right in the middle there. Why do you think it's in the middle there? Good. Excellent. What was your name? Lara. Lara, OK. Go on, this is keeping me fit. They don't know how to make these stairs steep. Right. Lara reckons there's a very faint one in the middle, which you can just about see. And Lara reckons that the faint one might be the asteroid, because asteroids are small. Very good. We hope we came across that earlier. So Lara might be right. Jack might be right. Mo might be right. But we've all got different answers. Now, does anybody think that they are definitely, absolutely certain, no questions asked, but they have definitely found the asteroid. OK, I'm not going to go around you all, but remember which one you were thinking of. I'm not going to embarrass you by getting you to point at it. Does anybody think that they haven't got the faintest idea? OK, most of you. Good. Because there's a problem. When we take a picture of a star, it looks like a dot. And when we take a picture of an asteroid, it looks like a dot. We can't tell the difference. So we have to do something else. We have to find some way of telling an asteroid from the star. Now, what do asteroids do that stars don't? Move. One picture is not enough. One observation doesn't do this. You can't tell what is an asteroid and what isn't. So what we do is we take three or even four. I've got three in this particular case. And we rapidly show them one after the other. It's called blinking. And if something moves, it's an asteroid. If it moves in a nice straight line, it's an asteroid. So what I'm going to do next is show you three observations taken one after the other. And when you think you can see something move in a nice straight line, just put your hand up, and we'll see how many of you can spot asteroids. Okay? So just put your hand up when you think you can see the asteroid. It keeps repeating.
You're going to get... If you're next to somebody who hasn't spotted it, can you point it out to them? It's up there. Give yourselves a round of applause. Well done. OK, enough. That's fine. That's all the applause you deserve. Because who's seen the second one? Oh, you think you've got the second one? Go on, go for it. Be brave. Well done. Sue is sitting right at the front, so Sue can see it. Most of you won't be able to. It's there. You just see it blown up on this version here. That little speck there, moving along. That is another asteroid. Now, this is the one I was trying to spot. This is the one we were trying to follow up. This is interesting for two reasons. First of all, we thought we'd lost it. This was an asteroid that we discovered several years ago, but nobody followed it up. Nobody found the orbit of it. Now we have done, with these extra observations, we know it's safe. It was in the list of potentially dangerous ones before that. So that's one interesting thing. And the second interesting thing is this was found by a 12-year-old girl in Lewisham. Not by me. I looked at these observations. I saw that one. I didn't look hard enough. And so we can see these asteroids if we look hard enough. And if you're lucky, you might even discover one. Now, do you think you can do this? Yeah, of course you can. Good. Because we really do need you to. I'm taking these observations two or three times a week of new asteroids. And I do not have time to follow them up. I do not have time to check them. But you do. All we need you to do is come along to the website where we're setting this thing up, check it every couple of days, see if there's anything new. And if there is, download it, find the asteroid, and tell me where in the image it is. We've got a form on the website. If you're interested in doing that, that is the website. Come along, try this out. We genuinely do need your help to do this particular bit of science. Time to summarise. Telescopes. Telescopes let us see the universe in completely new ways. We can see fainter things. We can look back in time. We can look at different kinds of light and understand the physics of what is going on. And that is what is astronomy is all about. And that's what we've been doing for the last 400 years, ever since Galileo started this. But the great thing about this is, and the thing that makes my job so exciting, is the more you look, and the more different ways you have to look, the more you see. And the more you see, the more interesting and exciting it gets. It's always new questions to be answered. There's always new things to be discovered. That's what makes astronomy the best job in the world. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>